Um, we are almost finished with the machine learning chapter. And uh, so only a few concluding remarks. There is this important question, can a machine find new features? Um, so what we did up to now was we were training functions uh, which are able to map a set of input variables onto one or more output variables. And the, the advancement that machine learning brings is we don't have to program this function. This function adjusts its parameters automatically. Um, but what a human engineer still has to do is to define the input variables. And if these input variables are not good, uh, nothing works. Yeah? So you really have to choose manually the right input features. Um, and this is uh, still an, um, yeah, an open question. As, uh, there are some approaches to this, um, even some solutions, but only partial solutions. For example, um, there, uh, yeah, you have seen uh, in the in the decision tree learning algorithm that this uh, information gain measure selects features automatically. And it not only sorts the features such that on the top of the tree I get the best feature first, it also selects from a maybe huge set of features those which are relevant. So you may provide 500 features and finally in the decision tree there are only three or four. Huh? Uh, so we, we can have a very good automatic selection of features out of a large set of features. But uh, you have to provide such a large set of, set of features. Okay, um, yeah. Oh yeah, clustering. And when we talk about features, clustering may be one way towards finding interesting features, but only sometimes. What you can do is a two-step procedure. In, the, in, in step one, we apply clustering. Let's look at a picture. Suppose we have obvious clusters like this. Then we apply clustering and we find some decision boundaries like this. Huh? So the clustering algorithm detects three classes. Huh? And now after detecting these uh, three classes, um, we can give names to these classes. We can call them A, B, and C. And then, for the future, um, we can label these features with the label A, these with B, and these with C. And then apply a supervised learning algorithm that, for the future, is able to separate these classes. Yeah. But the question is whether this makes sense for our application. Um, yeah. Oh yes, and also there is a, a new upcoming field called semi-supervised learning, yeah? um, which is a mixture of supervised learning and uh, yeah, maybe clustering. Um, and uh, this is the case if, if we have data like these, uh, but no, they, they don't need necessarily to be uh, really separated in space, so we just fill it all up. Okay. Um, and now suppose 
we have uh, two classes. And a few data from which are labeled may be these two and these three for, from the two classes. And now there are algorithms um, that make use of the labeled data and the unlabeled data too uh, in order to find then a uh, decision boundary somewhere here. Uh. Okay. Yeah, and now we uh, go to the next chapter on neural networks which actually is part of machine learning but because it's uh, quite a big part and also historically quite important uh, I gave it an extra chapter. Okay, so we start uh, approaching these algorithms uh, from, the, from the biological side. Yeah? Um, Oh, that's an interesting sentence. Circa 1900 biologically known. What does that mean? I guess it means that from the year 1900 on, uh, biologists knew about how uh, neurons look like and also how they work. Um, yeah. But the interesting point really is that the human brain has around 100 billion nerve cells, uh, which is quite a lot. So um, there is no, no idea how a computer with so many little processing units uh, could be constructed. Yes, um, okay, and uh, in 1943, this was a milestone, milestone. McCulloch and Pitts, they uh, developed a logical calculus of the ideas immanent in nervous activity. So they gave the first mathematical model of neurons. Yeah? Um, and um, yeah, so, so this opened the door into computational artificial neural networks. But at that time there were no computers so they couldn't implement it. But even more, I mean this is similar to what Turing did. He developed the Turing machine before there were any computers. Um, or like uh, Einstein, he developed the special relativity in 1905 when there was no chance to do any experiments uh, in this direction. Okay, and, and we could also call this neural networks uh, chapter the bionics fork of AI. Um, okay, yes, and very important is it that every neuron in the brain is connected to 1,000 to 10,000 other neurons. And that means how many cables are there in our brain yeah, we, ha we have to multiply this number with this number. So th this is 10 to the power uh, 10 times um, 10 power uh, something like 4. So we are between 10 power 13 and 14 uh, in terms of cables. Huh? That's quite a lot. So if, if every day uh, one out of uh, one out of a million cables fails, then we have uh, what is it? Ten to the power fourteen divided eight. So uh, yeah, ten to the power eight failures per day. That would be too much. <laughs> so uh, you see. Uh, uh, there must be either a tremendous um, um, what would I say 
a tremendous redundancy among these connections in the brain or an extreme stability. Yeah? But you know, you all know, if you're really a drunken, then millions of nerve cells uh, just die and uh, you're still able to think at least after a couple of hours or days. Okay. Yes, okay. So 10 to the 14 connections in the brain, but on the other side, the time of uh, that one impulse, one, you know, they call it a spike, a spike takes to travel from one neuron to its neighbor neuron is only about one millisecond. And we could call this one millisecond something like the, like the clock frequency in the brain. Yeah? So the clock frequency is, um, so no, the, the frequency is of course the inverse, which is one kilohertz. Yeah? Um, and um, typical computers have more than a gigahertz. So uh, 10, 10 uh, so it's, it's a, a, about a factor of one million slower than a PC. Huh? So a factor of one million slower, but um, the number of processing units is by a factor of 10 million uh, greater. And we know that still our brain performs better uh, with respect to many tasks. Okay, now uh, let's look at uh, how the, the, the wiring in the brain looks like. Of course, this is an, an extremely local picture. We have one neuron, this green thing here is one neuron, and the blue are some neighbor, neighbor neuron, neurons. Uh, the neuron uh, has a cell body, then there is uh, the axon, which is kind of the outgoing channel of the neuron. And uh, there are these dendrites, which are the incoming uh, wires to the neuron. And then what's very important, actually the most important part, are the synapses. The synapses are the, the points where the uh, outgoing axon wires are connected to the dendrites of the neighbor neurons. And the, the synapses are so important because the, the relevant processing, or not the processing, but storing, storing. The synapses, they are the bits in our storage. Yeah? Uh, processing uh, goes on in the cell body, but uh, storage is in the synapses. Yeah? I mean, that's why drugs and alcohol are not really good for our brain, because they affect the synapses. Yeah? Uh, I mean, this is really, biologically, this is really complicated and difficult huh? because what's going on there is chemistry. Uh, I mean, inside the neuron here, that's just uh, an electrical current. Huh? An electrical current flowing through the neuron, but here there, is, there really is a gap. There is a gap, so uh, it's no longer possible that this current just flows uh, over this gap, what happens here is chemistry. So, so kind of types of different types of ions move through there, and of course, it all depends on what chemical fluids are actually in this gap. Yeah? And these chemical fluids, they are called the neurotransmitters. Yeah? And if you take drugs or alcohol, then the, the chemistry on these gaps changes and, and then uh, all weird kind of things may happen. Okay, and the, the, the flow of information is like, uh, if an electrical signal, a so-called spike, 
is, for example, fired by this neuron. Then this spike goes over the axon and then splits up into all of these little wires. Then it comes to the synapse and now it all depends on how strong this synapse is. Strong means um, how good the conductivity of this synapse is. I mean that, that might be measured in electrical terms like a resistor. No? And if, uh, if the, the resistance uh, is very high, then only a very little part of this spike will go through to the neighbor uh, neuron. Or if it's a high conductivity, then all goes uh, through. It may even be the case that such a synapse is completely blocked so that the conductivity is zero and nothing of the signal uh, moves to the neighbor neuron. I mean, that's what actually happens during the learning process. And uh, so when we are learning, it turns out, and biologists, they have proven that if, if uh, you never use some part of the brain or some uh, neurons, then they will almost never send out these electrical spikes and the synapses will no longer be used and then they gradually die. Uh, and finally this connection is broken. Or if, you, if neurons are used very often then uh, these synapses will be uh, strengthened and the conductivity will be quite high. That's actually what happens during the learning process. That's all. Huh? And because the number of synapses is 10 to the power 14, which is quite a lot, and this builds up a very complex structure in the brain. And that's it. Huh? So that's basically how the brain works. Huh? That's what we know from biology. And of course, they, they know a little bit more. They know, for example, <coughs> And these uh, spikes. So if you look at uh, so the time dependency, we have here the time and here the voltage uh, U and <coughs> so if one neuron sends out such a spike then uh, yeah, the picture looks approximately like that. Something like that. Huh? So there is a, a large positive voltage followed by a uh, maybe somewhat smaller a smaller negative voltage and then it a little bit oscillates and that's how it's going on uh, so they know about this and yes of course what we also know and what's a big difference to um, a digital computer I talked about clock frequency clock frequency means that this one processor um, has a synchronous uh, trigger signal. Uh? So all the processing units in this processor synchronously at one time, uh, uh, time uh, step, they all uh, work at the same time. This is completely asynchronous. Uh? Uh, and of course, because it's so asynchronous, it's much more difficult and it's harder to understand what's going on. Huh? Oh yes, and also what's very important too is there are loops in our brain. Look, loops like this. I mean this is a loop of three neurons. I mean there are loops of two neurons, three, four, five and um, arbitrarily large loops. And such loops um, they are really hard to understand because the, the, the time dependent dynamics of such loops may be really um, difficult, really bad because um, there, there, there may occur such resonance effects such that, for example, if this neuron fires quite often then uh, as a consequence this neuron will also fire and then maybe this one and it, uh, you may get such a cycle where the, the firing 
increases and increases until um, until some catastrophic event occurs. Yeah? So that's what happens if we simulate such cycles of neurons. Yeah? So it's it's really uh, really difficult uh, to mathematically understand and model such cycles. And I I talked to a neuroscientist once and. Uh, yeah, so he gave a talk and in his talk he explained how they could understand cycles of two neurons. Just two neurons, huh? and not more. Uh, as soon as it's more than two neurons, it's getting mathematically so complex such that they, they, they couldn't investigate it yet. Huh? Okay, any questions about this picture? Okay, and now of course what we do is we try to simplify the whole picture and to abstract it. And I mean this is a more schematic picture with the same topology. And now the next question is how do we model the processing inside the neurons and how do we model these uh, connecting wires here? Okay, this is the mathematical model. So the neuron has n inputs, n input variables, and then inside the neuron, this is the processing that happens inside one neuron. Uh, uh, so this xi, this is the output of neuron i. So this is neuron number i. And uh, it has inputs from neurons xj. And the output is this value xi. And this xi is computed by uh, f of, and this here, you already know this, this is the weighted sum of all the inputs. Yeah? I mean these inputs now have two indices because we need this second index i because wij is the weight of the connection between neuron i, uh, neuron j and neuron i. Uh, that's why we have Wij, and you see this i here is a fixed index. Yeah? The running index is j, and j runs over these guys here. And this is this formula, where do you know it from? This weighted sum of the inputs from the percept one. So this is what we have. In, in brackets, it's the same function we have in the percept one. And now if this f is just such a, a threshold function, then we have a percept one. So if, um, if this f looks like that, so uh, here we, yeah, we draw x and uh, f of x um, if this is our function f, then what we have, well, what this neuron does is it's just a perceptron, nothing else. And now what, um, yeah, what happens in the perceptron during learning? In the perceptron, these weights they're adjusted. And also the threshold uh, theta. That's what's going on in the perceptron, and that's what happens in the neuron. Now let's look at these weights. The weights are the conductivities of these uh, incoming wires, or in biology that would be the synapses. And they're being adjusted during learning, and that's what happens in the neural networks too. But, I mean, what's different is that the learning algorithm in biology is not the perceptron learning algorithm. The learning in biology works different, and that's what we, what we will uh, look at in a few minutes. <coughs> okay, but now first, let's look at these functions f. I mean, in biology, you can imagine we don't have 
such a, a step function. Huh? Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, here we have this uh, threshold or step function. It's also called the heavy side step function. So it's uh, zero for x smaller than theta and one uh, for x greater than or equal to theta. Um, yeah. And now um, what the neuron does is this here. It applies the step function to the weighted sum of inputs and then we have a percept one. Okay, and I mean this is the picture you know from the percept one. That, that's nothing new. Um, but what's um, in most cases much, much better than the step function is the so-called sigmoid function. Yeah? Uh, sometimes also called the logistic function. Um, so it's 1 over 1 plus e to the power minus x. So this is the input. Huh? Um, yeah. And uh, I mean we can modify this function. And, no, let's look at this picture first. So if we take so this uh, black function, yeah. Um, so let's first put a zero here and look at this black function. This is one over one plus e to the power minus x. That's this black function. And now if we want to have the step not at zero but at some value theta, then we just put a minus theta here. And then it moves to some point theta. And now if we want to change the, the slope here in, in, uh, at our point theta, we want to have it uh, either uh, more steep or more flat. Um, and uh, I mean for uh, then we just put such a t here in the denominator in our formula and if t equals zero then we really have the step function so t equals zero is this and t equal infinity is this and so you can adjust uh, the slope here, that's actually the relevant part, uh, by this parameter t. And so this parameter t, um, it's kind of the, the degree of reaction of the neuron. Will it have an extreme reaction, which would be the step function, or only a, a very moderate reaction? That depends on this t parameter. So that's why we use uh, such a sigmoid function like that. Okay, and now the question is how does learning work? I already told you how it goes in biology. The simple rule is the more often a synapse is used, uh, the higher the conductivity will be and the less often the lower the conductivity will be. In the extreme case a synapse may really die uh, and then it's gone uh, and then the conductivity is zero. And, um, and this can be model, mo um, modeled by the so-called HEP rule invented by uh, HEP in 1949. So you see this is not, not uh, very long after uh, McCulloch and Pitts uh, gave the first model of mathematical model of a neuron and then HEP um, invented this uh, HEP and learning rule. And this is the HEP rule. <coughs> On the left hand side we have delta WIJ. 
delta wij is the amount um, of weight change. So the, yeah, actually the, the learning rule, I don't know, is it on the next slide? No. Wij of, let's put a t parameter, t plus 1 is equal to Wij of t plus delta Wij. So that means if in a time step t we have this weight, then at the next time step we have this weight. So we just add this delta Wij in one time step. Uh, so what, yeah, what you see is now, uh, this is one further simplification in our artificial neural networks. We assume that we have a discrete time. Uh, in biology everything is continuous and you have these really time dependent spikes. But here we really have a discrete weight change at one point in time and we just add such a delta Wij. And this is the relevant formula. The weight change is equal to Xi times Xj. So suppose we have here neuron number J and here neuron number I and this is Wij. And now the question is, how does this weight change? And um, yeah, we have to multiply xj times xi. So xj is the, the value of this neuron. Or in biology, it would be the voltage in this neuron and the voltage in this neuron. And these two voltages, they are being multiplied. So if, they, if the activation here is high and the activation here is high too, then uh, this weight will be uh, strengthened. Uh? If both have a very low activation, then, so suppose they're both uh, zero, um, then this delta will be zero. So nothing will change. Question? Yes, that may be that may be the case. So if if both are negative, what happens then? I mean that shouldn't be too difficult. What happens if both are negative? No, delta is positive. What is negative times negative? Uh, of course, yeah. yeah. So then we will have a positive change. That means our weight increases even if both activations are negative. And the idea behind this is the weight should change if there is a strong correlation between these two neurons. So if they are negative at the same time, that's kind of like a coincidence. Yeah? So this person thinks the same thing as me at the same time, and then there is some uh, kind of uh, connection between these two. But when do we have a negative delta W? When is it negative? It's negative if one uh, activation is positive and the other is negative. So if we have plus here and minus here, then we get a negative weight change. So this is kind of an anti-correlation. So if this guy is positive and this negative, then uh, we will have a negative influence on the weight. Okay, so up to now it's all quite simple. 
But we still, of course, don't understand how this whole thing uh, works. Um, but now let's look, let's look at such a simple mathematical model of this. Yeah? Um, and that's the so-called network. Yeah? Um, yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah, okay. Um, so here it, uh, it says, with the HEP rule, the weights can only grow. But this is, um, I mean, this is true if our activations of the neurons can only be positive. If we only have positive values, then the product can, can either be zero or positive, so the weights can only grow. But I as soon as we allow negative activations of the neurons, then uh, what happens is what we, what we already uh, explained. Look here. In the Hopfield uh, model, we allow neurons with positive and negative value, but only binary values. So such a neuron either uh, has the value plus one or minus one. And that's it. Yeah? And we use, we use the HEP rule for learning. Yeah? Um, yeah, OK, we already di discussed this question. Um, oh, yes, and what we, what we now do is the following thing. We, um, we implement an auto-associative memory. Now, uh, yeah, let me think, let me look, yeah. Um, yeah, let's look at this picture. So we have an array, uh, in order to understand it, suppose it's a two-dimensional array of neurons. Yeah? So the neurons are uh, in, in one plane, and there is neuron Xi, and there is neuron Xj, and we do have directed connections. Um, WJI and WIJ. Yeah? Um, these are the weights. So in the general case, we may have two weights between two neurons. Yeah? In the Hopfield model, we will assume that uh, the, the W matrix is symmetric which means that these two weights always are the same, and that actually means there is only one connection between two neurons. Okay, yeah. And what we do in the, in the Hopfield model is auto-associative memory, which means what is an, what is an, uh, an associative memory? Yeah. An associative memory is actually a function. It's such a black box F where you get a vector X in and out comes some vector Y. That's an associative memory. And an auto-associative memory is um, when the input and the output is the same. I mean, this is boring for us computer scientists because now we actually could, we could just omit this function. Why do we need such a function if it's the identity? We don't need it. Huh? Yes, we do need it if, if, for example, this input is noisy. Huh? So uh, if the input is not perfect, maybe there is some damage in the input, then this function may repair the input and as an output you get uh, the correct x. Yeah? So error, error correcting functions, that's the, the purpose for auto-associative memories. Yeah? Okay, and now what we do is we, we have such an array of neurons For example, such a pixel array, and now we can draw those which have the value 1 in white, like this, 
And then we have a pattern. We have a pattern and of course we have connections between these neurons. And yeah, in the Hopfield um, case, the whole network is fully connected. So every neuron is connected to every other neuron. That's what Hopfield does. And the idea is, for example, to learn patterns. To learn patterns that you impose on the network. And suppose this is one pattern that uh, the network has learned. And then you may input this pattern and it may be corrected by the network. And that's what uh, Hopfield networks really impressively do. Um, okay, yeah. So, yeah, let's, let's look at the learning algorithm. Um, okay. In the learning phase, we just impose binary coded patterns on the network. And we call them uh, Q1 through Qn. Yeah? So this is a vector, this is a vector, um, a binary bit vector that you just impose. Suppose uh, these neurons are numbered like x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6 and so on. Uh, and then you just impose one such a vector, one vector Q1 is just the pixel uh, uh, vector. Huh? And, oh yeah, and the values of these vectors, so QJI, uh, the components may be minus 101. Huh? So it's, it's just a bit. Huh? Okay, the network consists of n neurons. Uh, networks, the, the, uh, so we have a fully connected network and a symmetrical weight matrix, I already mentioned. Uh, but the diagonal elements, WII, they are zero. So what is not allowed are such connections. I mean, that's, these connections, they would make the dynamics of the network really um, bad. Huh? because now one neuron could influence itself and uh, then we may have such effects that the activation of a neuron oscillates all the time extremely or whatever. No? Okay, we looked at this. Yeah, and here we have uh, the learning algorithm. That's the learning algorithm of the Hopfield network. Um, we could almost call this, yeah, we could call this lazy learning because not much is to do during learning, especially there is no iterative process that may take a long time. So what we do is we set our, all our weights with this formula. Wij. So this is the formula for one weight between two neurons. Uh -huh. Yeah, let's look at two neurons. So here we have xj and here we have xi. And in between wij. And now how does this weight evolve? Yeah, look here we have the sum, sum over k equal 1 to p. Um, and this is the sum over all training patterns. We want our network to learn not just one pattern, but many patterns. And maybe for these two neurons, pattern number one is maybe like this, activation one here and a zero here. So for this pattern number one, we get a Q, what is Q? Uh, J is 1, so QI is 0 and, uh, no, minus 1 and QJ is plus 1. So the product is minus 1 and this is added to all the other terms from the other patterns. So we just sum it all up over all patterns. If you take it 
for one pattern. So for, uh, for example, for this pattern, we get x, uh, no, qi times qj is equal to, oh sorry, this would be uh, minus one. Uh, one times minus one is equal to minus one. Huh? And you see, this is, this is the hep rule. This is just the hep rule. This is the weight change. I mean, we could call this delta w i j is equal to this yeah? for the first pattern. And for the second pattern, again and again, and this results into this, uh, in the sum that we have there. So the, the learning phase in the Hopfield network is nothing but an implementation uh, of the HEP rule. Okay, so that's our lazy learning phase. And now how does the, our auto-associative memory work? So we have to input some maybe corrupted uh, pattern, huh? like this. Huh? And then, yeah, that's why we do lazy learning, then we start an iteration and that may take some time. Um, and this is the dynamics. This is how in every time step um, the activations of our neurons are being updated. And it's in nature, it's asynchronous. I mean, if, if we implement it, it's typically synchronous. Um, and how is this formula? Xi is equal to minus 1 or 1, of course. I mean, that's the only values which are allowed. It is minus 1 if the sum over j equal 1 to n wij. Look, we are updating neuron i. So we are updating this neuron. And now, of course, there are many connections to other neurons. And this sum here is about, it, it, it runs over all neighbor neurons from this neuron. And we sum up, yeah, I mean, what we have here, this sum is, it's just a weighted sum of all the inputs. That's nothing new. It's like we had in the perceptron. It's a weighted sum of all the inputs. And if the weighted sum of all the inputs is less than zero, we get a new activation of minus one. So you see again, this one neuron, it just works like a perceptron. It is a perceptron, it's a perceptron with a threshold zero. Yeah, so it outputs minus one if it's less than zero and it outputs one if it's greater than zero. Okay, the only, the only uh, change to the perceptron, the perceptron would output zero here and one here. But now our binary values are minus one and plus one. That's the difference. Yeah, that's all. N is the number of neighbor neurons. So here N would be one, two, three, four, five, six. That's a good question. Why do we have the 1 over n here? Huh. Is this the same in the book?
So I'm not really sure if this is correct. Yes, I guess it's correct, yes. Um, look, what we do here is um, we multiply two vectors. We multiply two vectors. Or, no, no, that's not true. W, I, J. Um, Yeah, I have to. I have to look at this. I'm, I'm not sure whether this is correct. Maybe it's because we take the sum uh, in the formula below from one to n. So yes, here it's a sum from one to n over all neighbors. Yeah. And if we wouldn't uh, do the one over n above, we would have n times. The yeah, maybe, maybe. I guess it, it actually does not matter. I mean, this is a constant factor that we have in front of the sum. So if we omit this constant factor, yeah, I guess it would have no influence because what we do here is we just check whether this sum is positive or negative and this has no influence on positive or negative. Yeah, okay, so it, it actually doesn't matter. Um, yeah, but I mean this is all about how the perceptron network works. Huh? Um, yes, and what's very important is when I do pattern recognition, I don't do just one step like it is in the perceptron. I iterate this whole process. It's being executed iteratively until convergence, hopefully. Hopefully the whole thing converges. So you, you have to imagine, so suppose we learn some patterns in our network and then we impose some new pattern maybe this pattern with uh, one, one, one false bit here. And then some, the dynamics evolves and maybe some other neurons change like that. But finally, hopefully, this, the original pattern is reconstructed. Okay, and now I will show you uh, a simulation How this how this works? There is a nice uh, a nice ap applet of the Hopf uh, Hopfield network in the internet, which we can look at now. Uh, yeah, where is the web browser? Yeah, here we have it. Um, so th there is a link. In the, in the bookmarks uh, to my book. I hope you have already looked at the web page of my book because there is a list, a sorted list of all my AI bookmarks and in the chapter on neural networks there is a link to this uh, page. Um, yeah. No? Okay. Um, so let's say clear and load. Yeah. So what happens is when I when I uh, hit the load button, then um, the Hopfield network loads a number of patterns. I mean, what you see here in this left square, this is a 10 by 10 pixel array, and each pixel corresponds to one Hopfield neuron and we have a fully connected network. And after, uh, when you load, then uh, a couple of uh, patterns are loaded. 
Yeah, so here you see uh, these four numbers, one through four, they are being loaded. And um, so loading already includes application of the hop field learning algorithm, which is, I mean, it's this lazy learning. You just compute the sum of the, um, the sum over QI, QJ. Yeah? Okay, and now, um, let's say, let's see, what are we doing? Yeah, go. In the, so what happens in this, in this right network here, um, here you have the, um, the, the recognition. Yeah? So you can, you can put some, uh, some pattern, I mean, down here you see the number of iterations. So now we are already at 1,000 iterations, and I have to stop it. And now it stops. And now let's. Um, so what we did here, we started with the empty pattern. But what's what's more interesting is I can take some some of these patterns, and now I can uh, randomly or however I want alter some bits. And this may be now a noisy pattern. And now we let the hop field dynamics uh, run. And you see what happens. It uh, reconstructs the, uh, the original pattern. OK, and now we are finished after 400 and something iterations. Um, and we can, uh, let's see, how do I get a different pattern here? Alter. Ah, uh -huh, okay, so maybe I, I, I have to, yeah. So we can use the, the two. Oh, and this is now a two corrupted. Oh, yes, here on the left you see we can say corruption 20%. Let's, let's take less than 20. 10%. Clear, alter. Okay, so now we have a two with 10% corruption. Um, and go. Yeah, that's it. Now let's take uh, three. Ten percent corruption. Go. Now how about these last two bits? Okay. Yeah, that's it. And now, of course, it's getting interesting if we take more than 10% corruption. Let's take 20%. Go. Yeah, it still works. And let's take more than 20. 30. Still works, quite stable. Now, how about 40? Uh-huh. That looks like my, we might get a 2, no. I mean, that's what we call creativity in neural networks. Now we get a new pattern. And it looks like this is now stable. What is it? Maybe it's a mixture between a 2 and a 3. Yeah, OK. I mean, but uh, a corruption of 40%, that's, uh, that's quite much. Yeah. So again, uh, clear and alter. Look at this. Would you recognize this as a corrupted three? 
No. So you, you can't uh, expect a good performance here. But even with 30%, uh, um, at least before it worked, I mean, it depends, of course, on the pattern. Let's see. Yeah, that looks quite good. Yeah. Okay, now let's let's do a different game. Let's store more, so we clear it all, and we store more patterns. We store like, let's say we store 10 patterns. And now, uh, no, load, uh, we have to load it first, okay. Oh, ah, stored patterns, 10, load. So what's going on here? So it looks like the automatic loading So I don't remember what did I do I it worked with with more than four patterns pattern 4 or 4 you don't press load because it said pattern uh, 1 of 15 you just selected 15 stop aha uh -huh, okay 29. Um, yes, but you, as you can see. Aha, okay. Now, okay, so what we can do is. No, no, no let's, let's say we, we do 10. So we have pattern number 4. This is pattern number 5. And now we may draw a five. Oh, that's not a five. But let's draw some new pattern. Like that. Oh. Okay, and we, we could store another pattern. Let's put an X, for example. And um, how about a zero? I should have brought a mouse. Oh, well, but why don't I use this pen? Ah, it, it, it inverts it all. Okay, next. Um, how about a six? Okay, now, um, yeah, let's take this six and use alter with 30%. That doesn't look too good. Okay. Yeah, it invents a new pattern. No, that's a new pattern. Okay, but let's do a less corruption. Let's say 10%. Another new invented pattern. Yeah. Um, okay, let's try another. 
example, this was our zero. Mm -hmm. We get uh, such a, a weird pattern. Is it the same we had before with the six? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, again. Let's try it again. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So you see there are some stable patterns which have not been learned. So this is this is not one of the of the trained patterns. Look at our training patterns. Yeah. These are all the training patterns. But le let's try it with one of these again. Go. Stop again. Okay, now it. Uh, let's see. Oh. <laughs> okay, now again. So we, we, at the beginning we get something similar to the four, but then it all disappears. Or here it immediately disappears. Mm -hmm. So the four seems to be not so nice. Ach so, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. That may that may be one reason. So we have uh, quite a number of empty patterns. Yes, that's uh, that's actually one of the reasons. Stop. Okay, but I mean you can play with this at home if you want. Um, what we what we found out is that with the four trained patterns, it worked quite well. I did some experiments. If you, for example, train 10 patterns and even if, uh, if not uh, four of the trained patterns are empty, you just train 10 patterns, then you will see it doesn't work that well. You get similar effects as we had it uh, now. Um, and the reason is uh, with 10 patterns on this uh, small network, um, the the storage capacity is uh, so, um, so so we stored uh, too many patterns the the number of patterns you can store of course obviously is limited and uh, the interesting thing is as soon as the number of patterns you store increases the storage capacity then everything gets chaotic. And then you see these effects we had. Huh? For example, uh, we start with a corrupted 3 and we, we get now something which looks like an 8 even if we didn't learn uh, such an 8. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's what happens in humans sometimes too. If you uh, try to learn more than your storage capacity, <laughs> then it may end up in some chaotic behavior. Yeah, okay. So, uh, of course, you're invited to play a little bit uh, with this nice uh, simulator. And also, of course, I mean, it's not hard to program this. Um, 
Oh yes, and what you also should, uh, yeah, here. Uh, you should be careful when you train your patterns. So one of the reasons why, for example, with the six, oh sorry, no, with the six it doesn't work very well. No, was it? Jetzt geht gar nichts mehr. Was ist denn das jetzt hier? Let's say load. Okay. Yeah. If you look at these patterns, um, they are um, the number of bits that is black is about half of the bits. This Hopfield algorithm in in the variant we have seen it, it um, works very well if about half of the bits are one and the other half is minus one. If you don't have a symmetric coverage of your image, then it doesn't work very well. That's the reason why with the six it didn't work, because the six was only thin lines, so it was much less than half of the, the image covered. Um, I mean, this problem can be corrected, and now we go back to the slides. Um, this can be co uh, corrected if here we don't use zero as the threshold, but we, we use a different uh, threshold. I mean, you see this zero makes the whole thing symmetric with respect to minus one and one. As soon as you use a positive or negative threshold here, then you can work with images where the percentage of black pixels is much less than a half. <coughs> yeah, and, and of course this threshold also has to be learned then with a somewhat different algorithm. Okay, yeah, now we have seen um, how this very simple algorithm works. We, we also have seen that it may show chaotic behavior if either we learn too many patterns or um, the percentage of black pixels is much, uh, much smaller than 0.5. Yeah? And that was the case when we had the 10 patterns because we had many white patterns. Yeah? Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, this is the uh, a little pseudocode of our Hopfield associ associator. Um, I mean, that's, that's very simple. So, um, we input some pattern Q. And this may be one of the training patterns with uh, some noise on it. And now we initialize all neurons so we set our vector x equal to q and then we go into this loop um, and in, in, in each um, iteration we randomly select one neuron. We randomly select one neuron and so this is neuron number i and now we update neuron i according to our update equation which was this one. That's all. So it's, it's really easy to implement. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, this is, uh, these are now pictures from the simulator. Um, yeah, what's interesting is the number of weights is, so it's a fully connected network with 100 neuron, so we have 100 times 99 uh, divided by 2, which is 4950 weights. So that's quite a big number of weights. Now here we have it with the four trained patterns. And uh, so we have, ten, with 10% 10 noise, it all works quite well. Huh? Um, Yes, uh, but here, down here, you see some stable states of the network 
that were not learned. So even with 10% noise, sometimes, not very often, sometimes it may happen that you get uh, such stable states. Um, yeah, and if, uh, so what I did, I trained these 10 patterns. Huh? Um, and with 10% noise, you have, we have these six patterns with 10% noise, and then we may get uh, such stable patterns. I mean, here everything is correct, but here for the, for the noisy three, we get this, and so on. Yeah. And now, uh, yeah, let's try to understand this algorithm. Um, actually, Hopfield, who invented this algorithm, he uh, was a physicist. And uh, so the, the, these Hopfield networks were first developed by a number of physicists. And um, they tried to understand it by a physical analogy. So here we have two neurons, and the activations may be one or minus one, and now there is an analogy to um, magnetic fields. So um, the activation plus one corresponds to a, such an um, a elementary magnet with uh, spin, uh, spin up, and here we have an, a magnet with uh, spin down. Huh? Um, and then you get a magnetic field, and these magnetic field lines, they go from the positive end of the magnet to the negative of the other magnet. Um, and if you have these two elementary magnets uh, arranged like that, then there is an attractive force. Huh? And if you would flip this one down, then you would have a repulsive force. Um, yes, and in physics, you can compute the force between such uh, um, two magnets, and you can even uh, compute the total energy in a, in a system with many magnets and this is the formula for the total energy. Um, so it's the sum, and you, uh, if you look at, at a pair, xi and xj, then the energy is xi times xj times such an interaction coefficient. I mean, that's about how strong the force is between these two guys. Huh? And as you see, this is, this is the same formula we had with our Hopfield uh, associator. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, here we have the sum Wijxj, which is the um, value, the new value of Xi. Yeah. So this is the force, this corresponds to the force that uh, we have on Xi uh, by neuron Xj, this term. And uh, for the total energy, then we have to multiply by the Xj, and then we have to sum over all, over all our spins. Okay, so uh, at least, I mean, we can compute the total energy um, yeah, and in physics also, similarly, we have no self-interaction. So if there is this elementary magnet, it cannot um, apply a force onto, onto itself. And also these weights are symmetric. Um, yes. Now let's, uh, let's look. Um, yeah, um, oh no, we don't have this picture here, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, now what happens in physics is the following. 
um, if we draw this energy function depending on our weights so and this is actually the weight vector so this is I mean it's 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 hard to draw this in one dimension we have many weights so in our simple network we had 4950 weights so this is a 4950 dimensional weight space in this 5000 dimensional weight space we can look at this energy function and then this would be a very complex energy function and what happens you know it from physics physical systems they tend to move to states with minimal energy if I release this chalk it falls down because this is the new state of lower energy yeah? um, so a physical system if you for example start it here and you would release it then it would uh, move down to such a, an energy minimum yeah? um, and this total energy we can compute the total energy of such a, a hop field network and now we start the hop field network with some corrupted pattern and the point is that the trained patterns the trained patterns they correspond to stable energy minima so if you if you use uh, if you start the network with a pattern which is one of the trained patterns but only uh, disturbed a little bit then the dynamics would move it down to such a, a learned stored energy minimum yeah? and so as long as it all works very well for example with the four stored pattern it worked very well um, so with the stored, uh, four stored patterns it may look like hopefully look like that three four huh? these are our four stored patterns and as long as you start with something which is close to one of the patterns it converges down to one of the patterns um, but if you store too many patterns then it maybe looks like this and then we may have local minima let's look at this situation yeah? draw it like that so I may have this little bit corrupted pattern and then it may move into such a, uh, a local minimum which has not been trained yeah? so as soon as we have too many patterns or corruption is too big then our dynamics may move the network into a stable state which have not been trained So you see we have uh, quite uh, complex dynamics yeah? Um, yeah. yeah okay in this formula we see um, this is the contribution of neuron i to the total energy this is xi times this uh, sum. I mean this is the weighted sum of the inputs to neuron i and if we multiply this with xi then this is the contribution of neuron i to the total energy and if I want to know the total energy of the whole network I have to uh, put a second sum over this the sum is over i. Okay yeah um yes so did i say this all yeah well, i mean that's very important the learned patterns are minima of the energy function but if too much too many patterns were learned then um, the system may converge to minima that are do not correspond to learned patterns and then we, I mean, that's what we then have, which is a change from ordered, from an ordered phase to chaos. 
It's a so-called phase change. That's a phase change, uh, and that's similar to what we oh, observe here outside. It's snowing now. What does that mean? There is a phase change from the liquid phase of rain of water to the solid phase of ice. Uh, um, and if you, if you look at such a phase transition from uh, liquid to solid, or no, from solid to liquid, if you take a, a block of ice, then uh, the structure of the molecules is fixed. You even have a really nicely ordered crystal structure, and um, as soon as it's liquid, it's chaotic. Yeah? There is a, a random structure of the mole molecules. It's even quite, uh, quite quick changes of the structure. Uh, so from the ordered phase, which is the solid, to the chaotic phase, which is the liquid, and there is a spontaneous phase change. I mean, isn't it surprising that um, at a temperature of minus one degrees, you can really stand on a lake and it's no problem, but as soon as the temperature is plus one, uh, then it's all liquid and you can't walk about, uh, on, the, on, on such a, a lake anymore. Um, it's a really discrete, spontaneous phase change. And that's different from, for example, different to other materials like glass. In glass, there is not this hard phase change. Glass is a liquid all the time. If you would look at these windows in uh, 50,000 years, then it would have uh, moved down and it's all down there. So in 50,000 years, if you come back here, you won't have any windows because these windows, they are like a liquid drop and they would fall down uh, or move down slowly. But the time constant uh, at this temperature is uh, so small, such that, uh, I mean, in 100 years you wouldn't see anything. Huh? Um, okay, but here, this is a system where we have this hard phase transition. So if the number of patterns that are stored is too high, then you're on the other side of the phase transition, you're in the chaotic phase, and uh, we, get, uh, we then get these problems. Huh? Okay, yes. Um, so, yeah, let me see. Um, yeah, let's, let's do this calculation uh, next time. Uh, because, I mean, here we can, we can at least try to a little bit understand what's going on in this phase change. Um, yeah, okay, thank you.